Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Family Matters for tonight. Um, we're going to be talking to Jonathan Bowen tonight, all the way from Canada. And uh, we're going to be talking about gaming. Now, times have moved on since the Space Invaders and the Pac-Man of the 1980s. Now, instead of spending time uh, with, with 20 cent computer games in an arcade or the local fish and chip shop, it takes place in the privacy of your own home, on your own device, whenever and wherever you want. Games in the 2020s are much more graphic, realistic, violent and addictive. Today's gaming is not restricted to teenage boys with nothing else to do. Instead, it affects all of us, males, females of all ages. Now, Jonathan tonight is going to share some gaming statistics with us and as well as some principles to help uh, keep us and our loved ones keeping our priorities right. So um, welcome, Jonathan. It's really good to have you here. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Let's just open with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be together tonight to be able to um, open your word and discuss the problems that affect us here today in this world. And we pray that what we discuss tonight will we'll go into hearts, that people will be able to change, to be able to, to turn their hearts toward you that the things of this world won't hold such an attraction as they do right now. Please help us to be ready for your kingdom. And as parents and members of families, Heavenly Father, please help us to be able to, to do what we need to do, to be able to get our priorities right and to be able to bring up the next generation in a way that honours you and it is prepared for your kingdom to come. Please be with us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Just before we begin, let's do a quick Bible reading. And we're going to do that from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And this is what it says. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they trade for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And the other one I'd really like to share with you tonight is Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So thanks for joining us, Jonathan. We're talking about gaming. What are we what are we talking about when we're talking about gaming? So basically, as you mentioned at the very beginning, things have changed drastically than from when I was a boy, and it was um, what we called Pong, Atari Pong, where there was two little, you know, things that went backwards and forwards and some little blip moved across the screen. Um, it's it's a massive industry today. Um, according to the stats of uh, one of the gaming uh, companies, actually, I, I printed off their, their little brochure. This is their, uh, their facts for 2021. I last looked at it in 2019, but with the, um, with the whole uh, coming of, of COVID, it's, it's ballooned. But now that's reckoned about 2.5 billion um, people around the world play video games, and that's pretty much 31% of the entire world's population so yeah. it's, and it's is that playing really regularly? Regularly. is that playing, playing regularly playing regularly yes so wow. the, the the idea is it's the stats they give us about 55 percent of males 45 percent of females which blew me away i thought it'd be more like more guys than girls so to speak but it's not um it's it's almost an even split um, between who is playing video games and it's everything from you know simple games like Tetris you know which is how I learned how to pack the family car putting little boxes in in sort of little spaces um, right up to extremely extravagant air sim air flight simulators driving games um, lots of sports games um, but especially a lot of um, what they call first person shooter games 
which are active, um, you know, um, you're right in the scene of, of some army going into war or whatever it might be. And it really crosses the gamut. There's, there's a whole uh, whack of different types of games that people are getting engaged in. Mm. So, so it's not it's not the realm of young teenage boys anymore. It's, no, it's, no, it's it's, 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 got, it's got everyone, hasn't it? Yeah, it's it's really. I mean, it's it's ridiculous in a way how fast it has grown. In fact, it has replaced um, movies as the leading form of entertainment, um, which I was amazed to actually realize. But it's um, it's absolutely huge. Seventy percent of parents. Um, say that basically um, they play video games with their children and um, the hours that are spent is about 50% of people playing games are playing more than seven hours a week. So that's like almost an entire work that's day's entire. worth of time. Um, you know, but some it's a heck of a lot more than even that. Um, mm. But it's, it's 20, like 30% is at least three hours 77 percent you know three plus hours but 51 percent more than than seven hours a week and it it covers really you know every age group um i thought it was more of a teenage thing it's actually 18 to 34 is the biggest age bracket um so what they call the millennials um you know that's the biggest age bracket in uh in uh gaming and it's huge but it also goes up those sort of 34 to 35 um 45 to 54 like the way it breaks it down there's a lot of people that are involved in playing games so so what do you see as being the problem with games video games well when you look at the statistics um and i and i pulled this off the other night just to kind of get my head around you know what the industry says so these are the people that advocate it right so these aren't these aren't your nutty christians who are saying that this isn't something we should do these are the people saying rah rah sis boom bar this is this is the best thing ever um and they even come out and say that in the age groups um it's about a 50 percent of people that are um, playing games are playing either action games or first person shooter games. So they are, I should say actually it's it's pretty much, and that's for the first from 18 to 44, it's about 50% is the, the really violent type of video games. Um, but they're also very much uh, available to youngsters as well. And, and kids are brilliant, you know, just try and I remember, you know, my dad couldn't sort of set the time on the on the on the microwave, you know, when we got a microwave, it flashed 12 o'clock forever. And, and as parents, we tend to be a bit that way where we just can't be bothered with some of the technology. Um, so the kids can very quickly find their way around it. And a lot of younger kids are playing some very um, violent games, but not just that, just heavily addictive games. It's the endorphin rush that the brain gets, and there's all kinds of studies on that as well. Um, it's right up there with cocaine, with, um, you know, sugar for a diabetic, you know, that sort of like extreme must have. Um, it's the same thing with video games, um, that it really is an addictive type of uh, activity. Yeah. So, so what do we see that might sort of, you know, the roll on knock on effect that might happen for people who are engaged in perhaps the more violent games? So it's not just it's not just the violent games. One of the things that they talk about is the lack of empathy that basically gets developed. And these are the, the eggheads in their conversations. Right. So they talk about the fact that they get people get detached from society. They get very insular um they don't like to communicate with people um and uh you know i mean it's bad enough with you know teenagers you know when you get a text message from somebody on the other side of the house and i would say to my kids don't you dare ever text me in my own house like that's not gonna happen <laughs> um, that's the way you know younger people tend to be they'd rather text than than facially connect um, and um, and that's one of the big things that's coming out of this is a disconnection from society. And of course, COVID didn't help because everything went to Zoom and all this kind of stuff. Um, but what's developed during that time is a real case of addiction. A lot of young people, um, you know, and I say young adults. Um, I mean, I go back to even when I was a factory um, manager. 
Um, and I would have my production team that worked under me come in and they would be blurry eyed and like, you know, I thought they'd all been out at the pub the night before, but they'd actually all been playing games together till mm -hmm. four o'clock in the morning, you know? So it went on all night and they would come to work groggy and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that's the world, you know, but that is becoming a huge issue, even within our ecclesias, is a lot of young people engaged in playing games for multitudes of hours. Um, and it just has become something that's really, you know, all engrossing. If we can get back to the, the war games, you know, and, and action games, um, one of the things that we've been discussing in New Zealand lately is um, military service. What, how would that go down? If, if we were facing a military tribunal and I, and I turn up and I've been playing um, some sort of war game, you know, first person shooting sort of game for, for 15 hours a week, what would that do to my military tribunal? Appeal? Well, if you go back um, to the last war where Christadelphians in North America, I, I could use an example, was the Vietnam War. One of the things that they were asked questions about was violent sports, like football, rugby, whatever it might be. That was actually one of the things that got brought up. And of course, well, you know, I'm not killing anybody. I'm actually, you know, engaged in, in a game, um, you know, and I'm playing now, you know, and it's a team and it's, you know, we're playing rugby and all this kind of stuff or football or whatever it might be. Now you take that to today and say, well, actually, I'm on a team, but we're running around pretending we're soldiers, we're shooting people, that kind of stuff. It really takes the conscientious part of conscientious objector and tosses it out the window. You know, conscientiousness is defined as, you know, wishing to do something that's right um, or somebody's duty thoroughly um, governed by our consciences. Right. Whereas. When you look at this, how can you say that this is, you know, I, I, you know, the scriptures say, turn the other tree, all the verses that we would use, you know, thou shalt not kill, um, all that kind of stuff, when we are actively engaged in entertainment with it. I, and, and you could say the same thing, you know, for watching violent movies, binge watching Netflix or whatever it might be. I'm not saying that one's worse than the other. It's the same type of thing I think that we'd run into. Um, but what's interesting is that the US Army has actually been using video games as its most effective recruiter um, as what they do. So they have big tra transport lorries that will go to um, colleges, universities, um, high schools, and they invite young people in and they play the video games and they actually have US Army um, esport teams. Um, where the, the soldiers are paid full time to play video games all day long and basically get online and chat with young people as young as 12 years old and invite them to enroll and enlist and basically work towards a career in the military. So they're using it. In fact, some of the first, you know, first Puritan shooter video games is one called America's Army was actually made by the U.S. military for this purpose. So. Okay. It's really crossing that line into you really don't have a shred of um, of hope to say, you know, I'm a conscientious objector when you're spending your time enjoying warfare, right? That's your that's your entertainment. Yeah. So what if I said, just just to, to put the cat among the pigeons, oh, but it's just pretend. Well, I would say there, I mean, I would I would look at um, Matthew, right? So if we went into what the Lord says, I'd say the principle of Matthew 5 here, um, and we look at verse 28, you know, the scripture says, you've heard in old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say, whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And he uses the same thing of violence as well. Um, here's the point is that basically, um, vicariously participating in adultery is equivalent to actually doing it um, when it comes to violence um, enjoyment in violence as far as god is concerned is basically equivalent to being involved in it um, and you think about this these are lusts of the flesh like violence is a lust of the flesh think of 
James, I think it's chapter four, where he talks about, you know, wars and fightings among you. Where do they come from? They come from your flesh, from your passion. So even when we get in arguments and, and battles amongst ourselves, it's our flesh that is basically um, displaying its characteristics. Um, violence is something the flesh enjoys. So, you know, I would like a good action movie. You know, I'm not interested in yeah. a romance. You know, that would be more the kind of thing that I would enjoy because flesh enjoys that kind of thing. Now, the real question is, what does God think about it? Mm. Mm. And do you think that there's, it's so much easier to blur the lines between reality and pretend when you engage in things that really um, I guess, make it seem more real in our minds like that? I think like more and more it becomes, um, there's definitely a blurring of reality because a lot of uh, young people, um, a lot of their time is spent online. In fact, there's whole e-worlds where you can go and buy apartments that don't actually exist. They're just in the, the you know, the internet world and, and people live in that world and they have businesses and sell things and they have vehicles that they can you know if you want to drive a lamborghini if you want to look like this if you want to you know hang around with whoever you can create this all whole aura for yourself that doesn't really exist and it's it's really escapism is what it is um and one of the articles i was reading is saying that you know video game escapism is on a par with alcohol and drugs it's basically feeding that endorphin rush it's creating an escape from reality my life i don't like my life i don't like the fact that i live where i live that i'm poor and my circle of friends is small so i can go online and i can become whatever i want to be and you know i can feed those lusts of you know having pride and you know it could be covetousness. I've got all this stuff. And the same is true even with, with, within video games. It's the whole idea of you're with a team and you're you're working with them and your persona is, you know, your stats of what you've done and people look up to you and, and it all kind of feeds that kind of thing. And it becomes reality as it's called virtual reality. And that's mm -hmm. what it becomes for a lot of people. Right. Over lockdown. A lot of, well, I mean, obviously we haven't been able to get together as CYCs or Ecclesias or anything like that. So I know that a lot of young people have started gaming together um, yes. and, and calling it fellowship time. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we have that anomaly over here as well. Um, it's not really an anomaly anymore. It's, it's quite a common thing. Um, mm. And in fact, it's not just young people, it's brethren um with their kids with the cyc we've seen that you know people have talked about that quite a bit um and my answer to that would really be like what is fellowship you know if we went into first of john um chapter one um he says there in verse six if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light um, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So fellowship is walking in the light and walking in the light is how we have fellowship with one another. So we might be spending time one with another, um, but we're not having fellowship in the sense of around the word. We might be chatting and talking and stuff like that. But when you compare what the the scriptures have to say about this idea in ephesians 5 um we have that whole thing there about being separate from the world and uncleanness let it not be named amongst the saints and things like that but if you come down to um verse 6 and, and i think this kind of speaks to this where he says let no man deceive you with vain words but because of these things comes the wrath of god upon the children of disobedience and that's all the things he's just named off that he says don't participate in and then he says let no man deceive you with vain words so quite often when he says let no man deceive you it means that chances are we're being deceived so he says do not be partakers with them in verse 7 because you were darkness but now you're supposed to be light walk as children of the light 
And in verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So to me, when we make that statement, if we're having fellowship by playing, let's say, a violent video game, my question would be, well, would the Lord Jesus Christ join us in this? You know, and my grandmother, my great grandmother actually used to say, you know, um, Psalm 1, blessed is he that sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. And that's why she would never be caught dead in a movie theater, right? So I'm not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. She just simply took that at face value. But for us, like if we were to say, okay, we're having fellowship, fellowship is first with the father and the son. So would they participate with us in this? And of course, the answer is absolutely not. You know, they, they wouldn't want a bar of it. Um, in fact, kingdom age, this is going to get taken away. So why would, you know, we want to engage in this now? In fact, just, uh, just think about this. It is Revelation 22, right? So right at the very end, he says, look, who's going to be in the kingdom? Verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments and they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city. Okay. But who's not there? without our dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and those who love and make a lie. So you've got whoremongers and murderers. So in a way, you could say pornography and the love of, of all those types of things, which, you know, is a real struggle, is kind of on a par with this violence, right? It's it's sort of a similar thing because pornography, you could argue, well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, doing anything. I'm not, you know, with anybody or whatever. So therefore it's okay, you know. Um, but going back to that principle that the Lord brought up, if we're doing this in our minds or in our hearts, we may as well be doing it. So, so it's kind of on a par. Um, and we don't often think of it that way. We think of it as, oh, it's, it's no problem. You know, it's not hurting anybody. Um, it's not real, um, you know, but again, the question has to be, what does God think of it? And that's the part that our conscience doesn't want to hear, right? So, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, I'm not standing here saying I'm better than anybody. Like, I'm not. I mean, we struggle with these things over here. That's why we're having this conversation. Because, yeah. you know, these are things that are in our families. They're in our ecclesias. They're in our in our society all around us. And we all struggle with different things. I might not struggle with gaming. You know, that might not be for me the issue, but it might be Netflix or movies or whatever it might be. It's really all the same thing. And it's learning to see it as God sees it. So when we say well, we're not really hurting somebody, you're actually who you are hurting is yourself. Right. Because you're making an impression on your mind um, that is really difficult to to get out of, of, of thinking. Um, and I just want to share two verses in the Psalms that I found super helpful just for myself, even in sort of, you know, you go through lockdown and it's like, well, what are you going to do with your time? Well, it's very easy to get a subscription to Netflix and just binge watch goodness knows what for hours. And it might be something totally benign science, whatever, you know, like, you know, ecology, you name it, penguins and stuff like that. But it's it's what we've got to be careful of is is that we are supposed to be redeeming the time but when it comes to the violence psalm 11 and verse 5 it says that the lord tries the righteous but the wicked and him that loves violence his soul hates and that one was kind of like a gong to me because like i said like if you were to say what kind of you know, movie would you like to watch? You know, you've got three choices. Mine would be the action one, because that's that's more what feeds my flesh. Wouldn't be my wife's thing, but that would be mine. But why? Well, because my soul, the flesh in me, and out of the heart, it's there that the things come from the defiler man. It loves violence. Well, God says, him that loves violence, my soul hates. So I've got to learn not to be involved in those things um i've got to learn to wean myself off of it but what about if, if you know if what gaming you're doing or, or what you're watching or whatever is is not really of a violent nature where does where does that sort of stand in in, in this discussion so you, you can start I, can looking at 
the different games, right? So, so what what genres are they? Let's say you you've got something called The Sims, right? Which is about building a little life. You know, it's not violent at all. You're going to build a house, and then you're going to build a city, and then you're going to add this and that and the other. And really, what it is all about is covetousness, hoarding of stuff, right? So. It's all about bigger, better barns, and and I've got this car and that car, and it's all a massing of all this kind of things, um, and it's covetousness. So that's the one side of it. But all of them kind of play to the the characteristic of pride. You know, I'm number one. Whatever the game might be, I'm number one. I've squashed all these other people to get to this place. It's king of the hill. You know, it's like you know playground bully kind of but the ability to do it in, in, a, in an electronic environment. So it's that side of it where it's feeding the flesh, but it's more than that, it's redeeming the time. And we are bought with a price and we're supposed to be redeeming the time. And, you know, when we, we think about, um, you know, where do we, what do we do with our minds? If we just go to Romans eight, you know, and this is, this is, um, stuff that we're we're familiar with the wording of um but we don't always think of it in terms of the practical things in our lives but i'm going to read it from the esv it's a little easier to understand um to set the mind uh, sorry to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to god for it does not submit to god's law indeed it cannot so you say, okay, a lot of these other types of videos, they might not be violent, but what are they? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? Bigger and better barns. It's all feeding the flesh on one level or another. And if all we're doing is stuffing that kind of stuff into our minds, our minds are just set on the things of the flesh. Mm. And, and it's not feeding the man of the spirit, whereas we're supposed to be redeeming the time. And so you think of Philippians um, chapter four, and this is, you know, and these are these are like, you know, poster verses, stick them on the wall, you know, and sometimes we like to do that. But like we've got to sit there and think, well, this actually has to impact um, my life. So Philippians four um, whatsoever is, you know, well, he says the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse seven. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's any praise, think on these things. That's what we've got to get our minds into. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And that's really the key is getting our minds into that because the, the reverse of this is what he talks about in Matthew. Um, and this is really, and this this speaks to all of it. It's not just video games, it's the whole world's entertainment, you know, um, genre, whatever it might be for us, which, you know, it's becoming video games more and more. Um, it's taken over most of the entertainment world. And in, in Mark, or Matthew, sorry, 22, he says, look, uh, and again, it, this is, I think the ESV, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is going to be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. And if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So we have that little Sunday school hymn, be careful little eyes what you see, right? So um, that's the thing is that if our eye is healthy, it then, and what we put into our heads is, is healthy. And I don't just mean bland. It's not like we're going to eat tofu or something that just has nothing to it. Um, it's about nutrition, right? So it's spiritual nutrition, what we're putting in. Um, because if all we do is feed it junk food, you know, so to speak, where it's it's easy, it's fun, it's like, you know, it's like going to McDonald's. It's great for the first five minutes and then you have indigestion for the rest of the day, you know. So it's sort of that sort of thing. But in, in 2 Corinthians 4, he says there in verse 3, when he's talking about preaching the truth to people, he says, look, if our gospel is hid, it's hid to those that are lost in whom 
the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So what we can do is cause our eyes to like, our, you know, glaze over. We can't see anymore. Our eyes become dark and our minds are blinded to the light of the glorious gospel. So that's the biggest, I think, challenge is that we spend all our time doing this. It's really a tough thing um, to, to get spiritual nourishment. So what would you suggest as the flip side to this of how we can, you know, build ourselves up in, in a way that gives us God and that gives God glory, but also is something that we want to be able to do? Because sometimes, you know, it can just seem seem a bit hard. The other God's ways can seem a bit. Ooh, sometimes it's far less appealing to do that than to turn on the computer and play a game. Oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and you see that. I mean, like you know, um, really, like one of the things I think has to be first of all recognizing this is a problem. You know, I would say that that's probably the first port of call is to recognize it's a problem like psalm 51 which applies on so many levels where the psalmist basically says david says i acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me against thee and thee only have i sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mayest be justified now acknowledging our sin to god why do we even need to do it he already knows it's not about him knowing it's about us coming to terms with that mm. and so it becomes then um, you know, like, and the Lord says in Luke, pray that you enter not into temptation. Um, and it's it's really about developing a taste um, for the things of, of, of the truth. So if you look at Romans 12, um, Romans 12 and, and the ninth verse says here, like, here's, here's what Paul says. He says, and this is a tough one, right, for our flesh. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Now that's easily said. It's an easy memory verse, right? But that's what our flesh finds really tough is abhorring that which is evil and cleaving to the good. So when I look at that, I think, and I used to say it as a young man, I used to think, how do we develop the desire, right? Because it's so easy to desire the things of the flesh, whether that's, you know, movies, video games, pornography, all those things, they're fleshly lusts that our body wants. You know, it wants us to feed it. Um, and so looking at the Lord and saying, well, how the heck did he do it? Because, you know, he was also made of the same stuff. And there's this little phrase in one of the Emmanuel prophecies in um, Isaiah 7. And it's the one where the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you're going to call his name Emmanuel. And that's Isaiah 7, verse 14. But then there's this little cryptic phrase, um, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And I, I read that and I thought, well, that's the answer to a boring evil and choosing good. It's actually a phrase that Paul has quoted, um, cleaving to that which is good and, and a boring that which is evil. It's coming right out of this passage in Isaiah. So I used to think, well, what on earth does that mean? I mean, I'm sure a diet of butter and honey isn't really going to do you that much good. You're going to clog your arteries and get diabetes, right? So it's sort of like there's obviously more to this. And so you start thinking about it and you think of, well, there's the milk of the word, right? Desire the milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Um, and the word is sweet. That word is sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Um, but it's actually a step further than that. It's the desire of the promises. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. So when you think of the Lord Jesus Christ and his greatest trials and temptations, if you go to Hebrews 12, so you think of the cross, which is kind of the culmination of all of his temptations through all his life. So in Hebrews chapter 12, and you, you have him there, and we're told there to look unto Jesus, verse two, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. So he 
had a developed a taste for the kingdom of God, a developed a taste for the promises. And so I would say, like, you know, that's one of the areas that we really need to um, work on is is getting that taste. It's not something that is natural. I mean, I I found out years ago I was diabetic. Right. So I love my Coca-Cola. Um, you know, and I love my my uh, chocolate bars and whatever else. Um, but went to the doctor and he said, look, kid, you know, um, this is going to kill you. You need to start making. Now, you can either just take the drugs and then eventually they'll start working and you'll end up on dialysis or you can change your lifestyle. And so um, I was like, well, I don't really want to die. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I had to learn to change my appetite. So things that I thought were gross, you know, as a kid, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, stuff like that, I was just thought they were hideous. As I weaned myself off the sugar, or actually I kind of went cold turkey as that's it, you know, and, and like I had these massive migraines and withdrawal symptoms and whatever, um, but I was motivated, right? Um, but as I weaned myself off the sugar, all of a sudden, all this other stuff started to taste good because I was no longer fooling my brain with false messages. So I stopped drinking the soft drinks. I stopped drinking the, or eating the chocolate. I stopped, you know, all the stuff that was, you know, and I probably lost, I think 80 pounds altogether during the well, process. But like, I had to learn to desire something else. And that I think is, is one of the keys is basically that idea of setting your mind on the things of the spirit. Um, you've got to learn to design. And that's a process, just like changing your diet is. You know, you've got to replace it with other stuff. Mm. Mm. So I've known I, I've known a couple or a few couples who whose marriages have eventually broken up because of because one partner is spending all their day gaming. Yeah. You got any advice or any thoughts, quick thoughts on um on what the the non-gaming partner can do about that you know or, or you know any advice for them so i would say the first thing is to recognize that we're all flesh right so you can't come at this from a condemning you know holier than thou you're you're going down this road sort of point of view um what we've got to do is recognize, like it says in Peter, we are heirs together of the grace of life, right? So we need to, we're in this together. Um, and unlike the world, we're not roommates, we're husband and wife. And, you know, we are both supposed to help each other. Um, and one of the first things is, is, like it says in James, confess your faults one to another, have an honest conversation about it. That's, that's really where it has to start is like, you know, how can we help each other to that? And it could be a husband, it could be a wife, it could be the wife addicted to Pinterest and Facebook and all she does is, you know, goes through all that stuff. It's, it's the same thing. If you just look at Ephesians 5, so this is where the husbands have a responsibility um, to make sure their wives are exposed to what I'm gonna call the WWW. Now it's not the World Wide Web of Iniquity, um, it's something else. And it's, you know, we know it. Husbands, love your wives. He, Ephesians 5, 23, as Christ loved the ecclesia, right? Washing it with the water of the word. So there's your WWW, right? So we've got to get the word back into our relationship somehow. Um, and that's that I think is one of the key things so when when a husband and wife run into this and the same is true like for the wife she is an help meet or fit for him and sometimes he may struggle and there might be struggles and the wife has to realize her job as his sister is to help him get to the kingdom his job as her husband is to help her get to the kingdom and it can't be a he said, she said, I'm better than you, you know, tit for tat like the world likes to get into. It's got to be, how can we reform our entire lives? Now, the question might be, so if you're spending all this time gaming, what are you not doing? You know, are you going to the Bible class? Are you doing your readings together? 
And so one of the things when Charlene and I were first married, we um, read the life of Robert Roberts. We were like, okay, if you're going to live together in the truth, we should look at, you know, how did some of our brethren live? And we lived, we, we read the life of Robert Roberts together, just to kind of get an idea of what was it like for them back then. Um, but reading a book together, uh, The Life of Christ by Melva Perkis, there's short little chapters. Um, you know, it's not like you need to read a ton, but basically activities together, listening to classes together, doing the Bible readings together, and really getting involved, like junior CYC, um, redeeming the time together so that you're you're now meshed together again in the word rather than drifting apart into two totally separate lives that become you know people say we've grown apart like what a load of rubbish i mean that's that's just choices a series of choices you've made you haven't grown apart you've decided yourselves apart and that's where we need to kind of take stock of it and, and turn it around Mm. In, our, in our previous chat, Jonathan, you shared with us uh, an initiative that you had going on over there with some of the young people. And I just found that really encouraging because I felt like that was a really positive way to, to get people engaged and involved in um, extended ecclesial life in a way that really fills them up and gives them a sense of purpose and, and, and hope. And can you share that with us? Sure. So I think like, um, one of the challenges coming out of COVID has been, you know, a lot of our young people feel disconnected, right? They feel disconnected from the ecclesia. They feel like don't necessarily have a role so much. Um, they might be out of CYC age, but not really fully engaged in ecclesial life. They might have kids yet or whatever it might be. Um, so we, we have a, a group of young people here that kind of fit that, that mold. So what we sort of thought was, well, one of the best ways, and this is the same with a young husband and wife as well, the best ways of, of doing, uh, of sorting this, is really comes out of Romans. So this is kind of the, the emphasis for it. It's, it's, this, um, it's this idea of how do we displace um, all of these things that are not necessarily so good. So it's Romans 8 and verse 13. He says, don't yield yourselves members or your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, as instruments of righteousness under God, right? So this is the thing that we can't let sin reign in our mortal bodies, right? So that's what he says previously. But the idea is that we have to mortify the deeds of the body through the flesh. I was reading chapter six over in eight. Um, that was the other one, eight verse 13. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So the idea is engagement, right? So we said, okay, we need to look at our ecclesia and say, how can we serve, right? What can we do? So the thought was, um, we have quite a few brothers and sisters, elderly, living away from the ecclesia. Uh, they might be an hour, an hour and a half. Um, so bring the ecclesia to them. So let's put together a little band of brothers and sisters who, you know, are then able to say, OK, you know, brother so and so, let's work on an excitation. You know, let's work on how to do um, prayers. Let's work on reading, not mutual improvement in the beat somebody over the head kind of way, but in the sense of how do we put a talk together? How do we do these things and then take it out? to um, areas of the ecclesial world that maybe don't have the, the benefit of the fellowship we have and you know have those young brothers and sisters run the little meeting where there's going to be you know maybe there's a piano and one of them can play and or maybe we do tapes i mean that's the right way well, i'm dating myself now an mp3 player or something or whatever <laughs> um but we can sing there's enough of us and maybe they've missed that zoom singing is pretty awful um like you know so you can actually do that together um and take that study to them but get into the word so that we're mortifying the flesh through the spirit and it could be like a little group where we say all right friend at work friend at school they asked about this idea the rapture okay as a group rather than gaming online now let's get together and study online and figure out how are we going to um, answer those questions? What is the arsenal of verses 
that we can use with the goal of winning that person, not winning the game, right? And, and just totally change our focus um, and pray to God for the opportunities because they will come. I mean, he does do that with us. He he will give us opportunities in our lives. Mm, yeah. So you were sharing with us that, that these these initiatives that you were doing was creating real excitement amongst the young people, and that uh, yeah they they were really enjoying this. Yes. Yeah. It's it's really been a um uh, I would say something that the engagement it's it's a feeling of purpose. Like I've got a job to do. Um, you know, we're going to go down to these brother and sister here and brother and sister there. They're super excited to see them. They, it's a small enough scale that they're not in, intimidated. You know what I mean? Like so that we can do do this and feel like you are serving. I'm now in use in the ecclesia because sometimes that's what can happen is we feel like we just don't belong. And so we we find solace in other areas. And COVID has really not helped that. I mean, it's it's been a challenge for sure. Um, but the excitement now of being able to serve, I mean, and that's that's something that really is gratifying way more when you go down and you help a brother and sister out than it is, you know, playing online for five minutes or five hours or whatever. Um, and, and then that's gone. Whereas that relationship building is going to last. Mm. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We've really enjoyed it tonight. Um, it's been it's been a real eye opener. Just you know, well, from the statistics to seeing what the Bible has to say to say about it, um, and and your personal advice for for people who are going through those struggles. Um, it's been really really great. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, really That's appreciate your time. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Um, coming up on Family Matters. In April, April the 25th, we're going to be talking to Ben Pitcher about social media. So a very, very similar, similar similar sort of subject. And then on May the 23rd, uh, we're going to be talking to Gary Steele again on pornography updated. So uh, those are the ones to look forward to in the next uh, couple of months. Um, your suggestions or offers of help or prayer and prayers are really appreciated, so please keep them coming. Um, and if you'd like to receive reminders or, um, or material um, about Family Matters, the resources that we get from each, each time, uh, just send me an email, robert at thinkythings.com, and uh, we'll put you on the email list and you'll get all the updates as they come out. Um, you'll also be able to find past recordings like this one on our website, Pecorana Christadelphians. Uh, just Google that and you'll you'll find that. Uh, so I just asked Jonathan if you wouldn't mind if you'd close with, if you could close with prayer, please. That would be Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Thank you. Lord God of Heavenly Father, great God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, we come before thee, Lord God, with thanksgiving in our hearts that you are indeed our God that you are not far from any one of us, Lord, and that by reaching out to you and confessing our faults and recognizing, Lord God, that we struggle with the flesh, we know that you are greater than all of our struggles, and we believe and have confidence that you can complete in us the work that you have begun. And so we pray that you would help us in these last dark days, times, Lord God, similar to Lot's, where he vexed his righteous soul in the things which he saw and heard, that you would deliver us as you delivered him to take us out of this world, that these days would be shortened for the elect's sake, but that you would help us while we struggle here, that you would strengthen us with your word, that we, as we turn to you, that you would open our minds and our hearts, that we can behold the wondrous things that are in this great book before us, and that you could strengthen us, Lord God, that we would be fed with these things, we would desire the milk of the word, and that we would grow by it, that we may become children of yours and useful to you both now and in that age to come. We thank you for the redemption we have through your son, for the way that you have provided for us, for we recognize if you should count iniquity that none of us could stand with thee before thee, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. And so we thank thee for this time we have, for your word you have given us, and for the hope that we have through thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and pray for his soon return and the establishment of the kingdom. And we ask this prayer through Jesus' name, amen.